Welcome to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast with Steve Gordon. Welcome to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Gordon, and uh, really excited about today's episode because I'm talking with Jason Friedman. And Jason is the founder and CEO of CX Formula, and he helps fast growing, really entrepreneurial companies. Uh, build for themselves an unfair advantage, I think. And, and I'm excited to get into how he does that. But really, he's focused on the art and science of designing the customer experience journey and, and really creating a step-by-step process for wowing your customers and turning them into raving fans. Um, and and I, this is going to be, I'm excited because this is a topic we haven't talked about yet on the podcast. And I think it's a really, really important topic. So many people focus their marketing on what happens to get the customer when there's so much leverage to be had by focusing on the experience that the customer has after you've acquired them. And Jason's done this successfully all over the place. He's worked with uh, stores to increase same store sales over 400%. He's raised over $6 billion uh, for, um, for endowments and, and uh, just done all kinds of things, worked with Fortune 100 companies all the way down to, uh, to small solopreneur businesses. So uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Jason, welcome to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Steve. Excited to be here. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So I, I guess to get started, give everybody a little bit of context. How did you get started in business and how did you get to where you are now? Yeah, so I have a, one of those twisty, turny, windy stories um, which I think probably a lot of people have. But uh, so I started out uh, in the back old days uh, as a theater person. So I, I did uh, lighting design for Broadway shows and for rock and roll shows. And so I toured with uh, Fleetwood Mac, Peter Gabriel, Run DMC and Public Enemy and Rush, which was my my favorite band. I couldn't wait to get on the road with them. And uh, I did that for a little while. And then I did some more legit theater tours. And um, going through that, process of creating, you know, uh, experiences in the entertainment business. Um, I was in this world where every single night there was a standing ovation and you start to like, look at how delighted customers are and how excited they are. And that just kind of set me up for what I was going to do for my whole career. I got kind of tired of doing the, the same show night after night, but what I loved was figuring out how to stage the show, how to choreograph all the stuff and how to make it be this exciting kind of opening night experience, if you will, over and over again. And so that led me into um, starting my first company where uh, what we did was really work with business owners. And at the time we started out, we actually worked with some big business owners like Universal Studios and Disney and Foot Locker and Bank of America and companies like that. And we helped them kind of take this theatrical entertainment um, aura, if you will, and kind of infuse it into the experience that they gave both to their customers and to their own employees inside the business and really started to use this this show business uh, methodology to to make their businesses grow. And so that's kind of how I did it. My business and myself, you know, we started out, it was me in my living room in Montclair, New Jersey in 1997. And when I sold the business in 2008, um, we had over you know, 2000 uh, employees and sub full, like pretty much full time subcontractors working for us. We had offices around the globe and, you know, we had sold over one hundred and fifty million dollars in, in products and services. And, uh, you know, when, and when I exited the business, I actually I, I stayed on for a couple of years when I sold it. But um, we were uh, we were pretty much a powerhouse in our space. And uh, and it was all doing exactly that. It was about focusing on the experience that we created for customers and for the employees and how to how to replicate that time and time again. So, yeah, that's um, I'm sitting here thinking like the way that you started out with all the tours that you went on, you know, as uh, as my teenage self, I'm sitting here thinking that's like the dream job. That's what we all wanted. Right. <laughs> to be able to go well, and, yeah, and go right. on, on, <laughs> on tour with our favorite band. Um, that's and, what happened, man. I, I, I saw the album cover. Uh, for my first Rush CD, or or actually probably a, it was an album at the time, and I was looking at all the different things, like you know, you read through, like you listen to the music, and I saw like lighting by, you know, scenery by, and I was like, you know, I like this lighting stuff, and I can maybe go out with that group, and uh, yeah, it just it set me on a road, and I'm a big goal setter kind of person, so I, I set goals and I, I fearlessly pursue them, so uh, definitely in the unstoppable way, so. Uh, yeah. uh, that's uh, really great. And, and I'm very excited to learn more about 
the way that you do that inside uh, of a business. Um, and, and you mentioned Disney and, and I've, I spent a lot of time sort of observing and studying what they do. Um, and so I want to get, get to that discussion, but before we get there, um, you, you've built a very big business and, um, and I know you've been involved in building multiple businesses for anybody that does that. Look, we all know there are are brick walls that get built right in front of us for some reason. And we've got to figure out how to, to make it through over around under somehow get past it. What are some of the things that, that you have picked up over the years that have really helped you push through when things get difficult, maybe mindsets or frameworks, ways of looking at things? Sure. Um, well, you know, I think the number one struggle that I and entrepreneurs that I work with today, coach and such have is this mindset challenge, right? I think, I think everyone does. And one of the things I learned, so I, I started in a, a coaching program. I got a coach myself, uh, Dan Sullivan from the strategic coach. I don't know if you know, Dan, mm-hmm. but, uh, Dan played a huge role in my life. And, you know, I started with him, I think it was like 2002 or 2003. So it was, it was a while back. And um, the first thing that, well, one of the first things I remember him teaching was this idea of goal setting and what he says or how he defined it. And I'm going to use my own words, but it's his concept is that, you know, goal setting is kind of like looking at the horizon line when you're, when you're flying an airplane where, you know, the, the horizon line is this, it's this point where the earth and the sky kind of meet, but it doesn't really exist. That never happens. And so the idea of if you think of your goals as that horizon line is something that sets you in motion and something that you can kind of use as a guiding point, it's really helpful. And so that was the first thing where it's like I didn't have to beat myself up about achieving that, but it pushed me in the right direction. So it gave me freedom to not hang on to the, to the destination, but to really think about the journey in a different way. So that, that's the first part. The second part of that same concept was uh, that he taught us how to measure our progress. And so if you look at your goal versus where you are, it's always a negative number or usually a negative number. If you look at your, your, where you are versus where you started, it's usually a positive number. And so by using that methodology in my daily practices of just kind of evaluating myself regularly as from whence I came to where I am versus where I wanted to get to, it gave me a positive number. And so I was able to really um, appreciate more of what the journey that I was going on and, and the progress that I was making. And as a, as an entrepreneur, you know, momentum is so important, just positive momentum. And so I wanted to do everything. And I've, I still, to this day, I do everything in my power to stay in a positive momentum cycle so that I'm always moving forward in some aspects, not everything's going to be that way. And that's okay. But, um, so, so that's the first kind of big thing. The second big thing I would say um, is really more about, uh, the stop doing list. And, uh, I mean, these are kind of tactics, but they're also strategies, you know? And, and so, so I learned in this, I, I learned from Jim Collins, um, who wrote good to great and, um, built to last. And so, you know, I was at a conference where he was speaking and, you know, he, he mentioned that we should take out a pencil and start writing a stop doing list. What are the things that are getting in the way of us achieving the goals that we want to make? happen or the things that we want to accomplish. And I find that, you know, I did an activity inventory. I literally just made a list of every single thing I did as minute as possible. Like, you know, put a stamp on an envelope to, um, you know, to, uh, come up with a big business idea, like everything that I was doing. And I was looking at all the stuff that I was had on my list that was stopping me from working in my unique ability, focusing on the things that I'm best at. And I was filling up my day, uh, probably over 90% with stuff that, was not moving the ball forward. That was, you know, urgent, not important. That wasn't focused on, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't helping me focus on what I wanted to do best or what I should be doing best. And so stop doing was like a real mission for me. And it, to this day, it still is. It's, it's like learning how to say no to certain things, learning how to delegate certain things, learning how to just take certain things off your plate completely. Cause they're just, they're just in the way. And so really getting clear on, and, you know, kind of filtering the best opportunities, not being afraid of, you know, I missed out on something, you know, and just being really clear on your why on your personal mission and where you should be focusing your time is just so important for me. And it really shifted my mindset as far as, you know, what I was working on. So I would, I would choose like three projects a quarter that I would focus my energy on. And those three projects, you know, my, my rule was like, 
what three things sh- should I be working on? Big, big picture things should I be working on over the next 90 days that if I did nothing else, those would be moving the ball forward towards where I wanted to be. And then other stuff would be able to fill in when I had time, if I chose, but really being clear about my priorities and limiting it to three things uh, was, tr- I mean, transformational in my life, in my relationships, in my, in my health. Um, because you know, you run your, as entrepreneurs, we run ourselves ragged. We make ourselves crazy. We, we take on more because we think we're helping ourselves and helping other people. And, and a lot of times for entrepreneurs, it's, we're doing it for other people, not even for ourselves. And so there has to be a little bit of kind of selfishness. And I say that in, in a positive way where you have to take care of yourself, you know? Um, so, so for me it was that. And then the last thing was a daily gratitude journal. Um, just kind of focusing every single day, writing down three things that I was grateful for. Because uh, when gratitude is permeating your experience um, and permeating your thoughts and you start your day out that way, at least for me, uh, it was hard to let some of those other pieces come in. And so I, I would try and start my day off, like really protect my mornings and protect my focus in the mornings of what I was going to do, how I was going to work, who I was grateful for. And, uh, and, and owning that really changed the game for me. So I think those are my big ones. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing those. Um, uh, you mentioned Dan Sullivan. He's a mentor of mine as well. And, and that concept, um, I think he calls it the gap and the gain where yep. so many times you see folks just, just abuse themselves because they're, they're looking out at that goal that they want to achieve. And they're not there yet. Right. And if you've got big goals, you're, you're not, you're never going to be there yet. Not, my experience, the way I sort of experience goal setting is that when I set a goal and I'm heading towards it, before I even get to the goal that I set, I, I'm already seeing beyond it to the next one, you yeah. know? And so I ne- it's like the horizon, like you say, you, I, I never get to the goal because there's always then the one beyond it that I've, I've now envisioned. And that yeah. was really transformational for me to, and the concept that, that, uh, Dan Sullivan has is to to look back to where you started and measure all of your progress, all of your worth, your value, your accomplishment from where you started, which is really the right place to measure it from rather 100%. than what most people do and, and look out and look how far away you are from the goal because you can't get there. Um, I think that that is a really critical strategy and I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, yeah, I'll say one more thing about that just to punctuate it, because I think obviously we're both uh, we're both Dan disciples, as it were. And, uh, you know, he's, he's awesome. And the idea of the gap, it's what I was saying before. It's always that negative number if you're measuring against where you want to go. And that's the gap, what he defines as a gap. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I can have a wonderful idea. I can really sit down and map my whole future out. But as I get going on that journey, stuff's going to change and evolve. And so if you're not so rigid, if, that, if you do think about it as the horizon line, like you said, it may be the next goal. It may be a slightly different goal or a, or a variation of that. And the other thing that Dan talks about, another Dan term, is strategic byproducts. So what I found happens a lot of times is that as I go after a goal, four or five other amazing things will happen that were unintended. And so we have some really positive unintended consequences that come out of these, uh, out of this kind of exercise. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you've you've felt it yourself. You know, I, I started a whole business accidentally because I was going down this road of a goal and I saw this other opportunity and it was on mission for what I was doing. And, you know, that business generated hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit right to the bottom line. It wasn't even part of the plan. It was enabling that goal to happen. And so, I, you know, I think it's just um, it's just really important to, to enjoy the journey. You know, to me, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit more later, but, you know, I, I like to play games with myself. Like I gamify everything. It's one of the things I teach. And so, like, I look at this as a game to some extent, and I want to play it. And I do want to win, but um, I want to, I want to, I want to go through the steps along the way. I want to learn at the steps. I want to, I want to reward myself when I make that progress. And I do this with my kids. I do this with employees. I do this with clients. And the more I can, you know, get them engaged in the game, the more results they have, and the faster they get to that finish line. So I think it's important to think of it, like all of it as a game. Well, and not just think of it as a game. And I'm, you know, I, I grew up playing sports and, and, you know, my wife would tell you I'm extremely competitive. My kids will <laughs> tell you I'm extremely competitive. I do not like to lose to anyone. Um, however, the thing that I have learned is that in business, 
um, early on for me, um, and, and I, I started running my first company, I was 28 years old, and I, I was really pretty naive at that, at that age about all of it. And I looked out around at competitors as a way of judging whether or not I was winning or making progress. And that's a really bad way to do it, I think, um, because I it, it forces you into some some kind of stupid decisions about things. And what I've learned since then is that if if I can make the game up, you know, and I'm playing my own game, number one, I can't lose. And exactly. And, uh, you know, because I can change the game. And number two is it's a heck of a lot more fun. Um, you're playing the game you want to play rather than trying to play somebody else's script. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. And that's, that's actually a lot of the words I use. It's that, you know, and that to me, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a small business owner, you know, you get into business, most of us get into business for the freedom, the freedom to be with our kids when we want to, the freedom to make some more money, or, or at least be in control of our own destiny. And it's all about playing your own game. And then somehow we get sucked up or sucked into some other people's games. And they they start writing the rules for us. And and we're rule breakers to begin with, you know? So um, so I think that's so important what you just said. Like, you know, and I do, I think it's a game, but I think it's your game and you need to you need to play the game your way. Um, yeah, so I, I, I love I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, and I, just so in, in those three little things that you shared, the, the idea of measuring your progress from where you started. Um, I think the second one, the, the stop doing list, I was having breakfast with a, a longtime client and, and, and really a great friend this morning um, before our call. And uh, one of the things that, that always um, amazes me about this guy is his clarity around what he's not going to do. And he wouldn't say stop doing list. He'd, he'd say, I just, I exercise the, the most powerful language, or p- powerful word in the English language, and that's no. Oh, yep. And uh, and I exercise it a lot. I work out, as he says it. I work out my nose, um, and 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 having the confidence to do that. And again, I think that comes back to the clarity of of really defining what game you're playing. Because if you're really clear on the game you're playing, it's very easy to make decisions about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Hundred percent. I I have not mastered the word no. It's uh, it's the hardest word in the English dictionary to me to learn uh, the real meaning of and and to be. Im- I guess to be empowered enough or to empower myself enough to use that word more because uh, I struggle with that, you know, and I gotten better at it and better at it. And so for me, like the stop doing list has to be my first thing because I already have too much. So I have to take some stuff off and then I have to be doing the no at the same time. So I'm not adding more to it. And so I think those two ideas have to really be, you know, kind of working in parallel with one another. Yeah, so, completely. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, thank you. You've shared a, a ton. And, and I really want to dive into the, the great work you're doing with customer experience. So um, we're going to take a quick pause. We're going to be back with more from Jason. And we're going to really dive into how to create a just an outstanding customer experience for your customers and clients. Hi, this is Steve. I hope you're enjoying this interview. We've got more to come in a minute, but what I'd love for you to do right now is rate this podcast. Leave us a review, rate us on iTunes. It'll really help others discover the podcast and help us help other CEOs, other business leaders become unstoppable. So if you go to unstoppableceo.net forward slash iTunes, you can find instructions there and links that will take you right to where you need to go to review the podcast. Thanks so much. Now back to the interview. All right. Welcome back. We're here with Jason Friedman. And uh, Jason, you, you just uh, really blew me away with what you shared in the first half of the interview. Um, and I know we're just getting started. Your expertise is really around designing an experience for companies so that their customers, um, I think you use the, the, the phrase standing ovation. Um, when yeah. we started that their, their customers really give them the standing ovation. And I can tell you, I've ex- experienced a lot of businesses where um, it's, it's far from that. And I, I've, I've experienced a lot of businesses where maybe they aspire to that, but they have trouble, they struggle with it. So I'm, I'm really anxious to hear your approach and how you work with businesses to, to create that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the first thing that just to kind of, I just want to define what I call customer experience just so that we're all on the same playing field. Um, Cause I think it's a, it's just this kind of jargony big word you hear thrown around a lot. And so to me, the definition that I use is 
customer experience is about the experience that your customers are having um, and uh, with, with your brand or organization, but it's their perception of that experience. It's not necessarily what is actually happening. It's how they feel about it, how they perceive it to be going on. And so there's a lot of disconnect sometimes with companies. In fact, there's some great research by Bain and Company. They did a survey of uh, a ton of CEOs and then their same customers. What they found is that 80% of the CEOs reported that they were providing an amazing customer experience, that their customers loved them, that it was just phenomenal. And then the same customers that they interviewed, they had only 8% of those customers agreed with the CEOs. So that, that huge divide is what I call the experience gap. And it's the difference between what the perception of the company is versus the perception of the customer. And so, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, small business owners, large business owners, uh, you know, middle managers, what have you. And it's hard for most of them to admit that the experience that they're providing may not be optimal. And they don't even and, and, and a lot of them, it's not even that they don't admit it. It's that they don't even know, like they think that their experience is great. Yet they have customers that are not purchasing multiple times for them. They don't have the same amount of word of mouth or referrals. They don't have um, positive reviews being left. They may have no reviews being left online, but the, and so they may not be getting negative. So they think, oh, everything's good. I'm not getting negative reviews. That kind of means that you're not pissing off your customers. It doesn't mean that you're delighting your customers, right? And so um, it's really important to start to think about it. And and the second thing that's kind of happening, uh, and it's been happening for decades, this is not new, but it's happening at a much more rapid pace, is that we're in what I call the experience revolution. Customers have more access to information than ever before. They have more choices and can find more of your competitors, for example. Than it would, it's like a quick, quick search on Google, right? And, and all of a sudden, they also see this, you know, customer megaphone, like you, you log into the internet and you Google a company and you start seeing oftentimes like tons of negative reviews on Yelp or Google or Facebook or whatever. And it's so easy for customers to complain today. Like it's, it takes a second and they can be broadcasting. Like everyone's a publisher now. Everyone's a broadcaster. Everyone can get out there and put information online and there's not the same level of filtration that there once was. And so this can be really damaging to a business. So it's more important than ever before. You know, there's some statistics that show that uh, over 80% of tweets about businesses are negative or critical in nature. Uh, and so, you know, as you start to think about it, I mean, it's really hard to get negative reviews removed. It's really hard to, it takes 12 positive experiences to remove just one negative experience. And so it's really in our best interest to do uh, a good job for our customers to really take care of our customers by design. And what happens more than often is that custom, the experience that customers have is what I call a default experience. It's whatever it is because people didn't engineer it. They didn't choreograph it. They didn't think it through and they didn't plan it out. And so what I try and teach business owners and uh, entrepreneurs to, to do is to really be intentional with their customers' experience, to really think it through and the first thing you need to do is you need to put yourself in your customer's shoes. You need to put on their glasses and you need to walk a mile in their shoes. And it's hard to do that. You have to really divorce yourself to some extent from the business and see what is it that they experience every, at every interaction with your brand, your product, your service, your event, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, the way I like to do it, so I go back to my theater roots and, and I use this idea of... Um, uh, role playing and acting. And so there was a guy by the name of Konstantin Stanislavski. He's a, an old time Russian theater director. And in the early 1900s, he was helping actors be more believable on stage. So like you'd go to watch a show and you'd see an actor playing a role and you'd be like, like that guy's not sick. That looks ridiculous. And he was like offended by this. So he, he created this whole process to get actors to be more believable on stage. And it's a process that everyone, like the best actors today, you know, Robert De Niro and, you know, hundreds of them uh, use today. It's the same idea of how do you actually get into character? And so when I start to help people think about their customer, and some people call it an avatar, I like to call it a customer persona. But when you start to really define that persona or that avatar, I want you to actually get into character. I want you to become them. I want you to look at it through their eyes as much as possible. So I would challenge you to say, okay, I'm going to play this customer on stage. I'm going to be them. What are all the things that they're going to say? How are they going to be moving? What's going on in their life 
that's influencing their behaviors and their actions and stuff that's unrelated to your business. Like we have to look at them in kind of their, their total holistic, uh, a hol- holistic way so we can understand what their world is. Like what, what music groups do they like? What brands do they like to shop with, uh, shop in? What, what kind of car do they drive? Are they married? Are they single? Do they have children? Do they not have children? Are they young? Are they old? Are they sick? Are they healthy? You know, what are those kinds of things? Because as you start to understand the customer on such a deep level, you can start to actually deliver on what they want, not just what they need. Customers buy what they want. They don't buy what they need all the time. And so if the needs and wants align, that's great. But more often than not, you know, we're selling someone something that we know they need. We know this will transform their business. We know this will make their health better. We know this will make them, you know, whatever it is, but they don't see it. And so we're fighting this uphill battle. We're trying to like kind of sell them something preventative and selling prevention is really hard. Whereas if we shift it and we understand what the customer really truly wants and desires, we can actually sell them what they need, give them what they need. Uh, sorry, sell them what they want and give them what they want and what they need. And and then in that situation, the customer starts having way more progress. So I, I like to start out by really deeply understanding, understanding our customers. And and that's step one when you're really looking at how to, how to design a positive experience for your customers. It's not about you, the business. It's about them, the customer. Now, just a quick caveat. It's not, it doesn't mean the customer is always right. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that it is about the needs, the desires, and managing those customers' expectations. Because when we don't do that, that's when we start getting disgruntled people, we start getting annoyed people, frustrated, what have you. So really managing that expectation setting and finding the right fit customers. A lot of our businesses out there don't have the right customers. You know, we got people that bought from us, and those are our quote-unquote customers, but they're not always the right fit for our brand, for the way we like to transact business, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's the first thing. And, and then the second thing is, you know, most businesses that I talk to, they get most of their business through referrals, through word of mouth, through uh, recommendations, through social proof, you know, uh, reviews online, posts online, things like that, uh, testimonials, case studies, whatever it is that they, they happen to be using. But it's all about customers that want to say positive things about them. And, you know, if, if you look at the statistics, you know, most of us will buy, uh, we're more likely to buy from a referral from someone we know or someone we don't know than just buy like on our own. So like, for example, if you're going to go out and buy a new software application, you might go online, you might Google it, you might go to their website and you see tons of customer testimonials. You might go to a, a, a ratings and review site and see, you know, hundreds of five star reviews. You might go to Amazon to buy a book you see, you know, 2000 positive reviews on Amazon, you're like, cool. You don't know those 2000 people. You don't even usually go dig in to see who any of them are. If you know any of them, you're just like, cool, people like this. This is great. And so word of mouth and referrals in social proof is so critically important. And so the question I ask you and, and anyone, uh, anyone that's listening and everyone else that I talk to is if you had the opportunity to exactly script what your customers would say about you. You know exactly what you'd want them to say. And the answer is usually, well, I mean, not exactly, but, you know, or no, I never thought about it. And so this word of mouth, this like this wonderful holy grail that we're all going for, which we should go for, by the way, it's the best thing in the world. It's, it's again, it's by default, not by design. So what I would, what I would urge you to do is take each of these customer avatars or personas and write a script so if they just finished your book, reading your book, or they just finished attending your live workshop, or they just listened to a podcast episode, what would you love for them to go say to five other people? What would be the wonderful thing that you'd like them to write in an online review? And use lots of details like, you know, oh my God, I just listened to Steve's podcast episode and it was amazing. Like it gave me three cool insights that, that I, like already I can see how it's going to change the trajectory of my entire business. Like that would be an amazing review. And then other people might want to come listen to it if that's the case. And so if you can get to that point where you, and I call that the ideal customer script, you really just write it and you script it. What it does is it allows you to reverse, reverse engineer the process, the touch points, the journey that the customers go on with your business. And so if I know that I want them to say, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, then I make sure that I, I touch them with X, Y, and Z in the right order. I give them some language around it. I'll use words like, you know, so if you just do these three things, 
you focus on, you know, setting goals that put you in motion. You focus on your stop doing list and you focus on saying no. And, you know, then it's going to transform your life. If I start saying those things and really giving them good, clear examples and showing people how that's going to help them, then they're probably going to leave. And again, they'll have those words. They'll have that language already. And so the, the, the best thing I can have anyone do is to really be thoughtful about that. Think that through and then we can reverse engineer the process to do that. What, what I think is so smart about that is by creating that picture of what you want them to really say about you, how they'll, how they'll describe the experience. It's, uh, you know, kind of the principle uh, that, that Stephen Covey put out there, begin with the end in mind. And now, exactly you, you know, now you have a very clear view of what you're trying to create, right? Because really for all of us, the thing that we're selling is, is an experience for the customer. I mean, you know, we might call, you know, it might get delivered in the form of a product. It, it might get delivered in the form of a service, but ultimately it's how they experience interacting with the product or how they experience interacting with the service. But if you're very clear about what you want that experience to be, it's now, I think, so much easier to work backwards, you know, kind of walk backwards from that and, and now build the service or build the product to, uh, to you know, to fulfill that. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, I'm furiously taking notes here. So I, you've <laughs> now given me homework to do. Uh, listen, I hope if, if, if you do nothing else, really do the, do the exercise of getting in your customer's shoes and writing what you want them to say. It will, like, this is my promise to you. I, I'll give you m your, your money back for this podcast episode. <laughs> um, you know, it's my promise. Like, that will change the trajectory. You'll find, you'll find a bunch of things that are not working right in your business. You'll find opportunities to enhance it. You'll find things that are working right that you want to you wanna, you wanna replicate in other areas of your business. It's super powerful. There's, so there's this formula. I mean, I, my business is called CX Formula. The program I teach is a CX Formula coaching and workshop program. And the, the way the formula works, so I have an actual mathematical formula, quote unquote. It's A plus B equals R. And what that stands for is attitudes plus behaviors equal results. And so these results are, you know, they're, they, they're informed by this ideal customer script. So if you write this script, you'll start to understand the results and it gets more detailed. I, I teach, there's, a, you know, modules and modules of training on this, right? But just at the highest level, I, I want you to take value away from this episode. So, so if you understand that results from that customer script period perspective, then you can go back. And so the attitudes drive the behaviors, behaviors that the customers have are what get you those results. And so the attitudes are not always able to be controlled. It's the way that the people feel when they come into your world. It's the other things happening in the world that affect those things. So the way that we, the way that we actually kind of, quote unquote, manipulate the attitudes is that we inject experiences into the mix. So the experiences then influence the attitudes that drive the behaviors that get you those results. And so it's really important. So what we do is we have this whole mapping process that we go through to map all the touch points of your experience out. And when you do that, we look at it on seven specific criteria. What are people doing? What are they thinking and expecting? What are they using? Who are they interacting with? And how are they feeling? Those are the first five. And those are on what we call the front stage side, all the things that are directly touching the customer. Then on the back side, we look at what are they using and who are they interacting with and what are the systems, technologies, you know, pieces, parts that are, that are part of that. And so when we look at it that way, we can actually analyze each and every one of the touch points that your customer has with your business on those seven criteria, and we can start to fine tune it. We, again, this is part of how we go into the back end. What ultimately happens, so customer experience is great. It's a nice idea. It's a, it's a cool word. It's, you know, it's like if we have a good one, it feels good. But the reality is, is what happens is we build systems and processes behind the scenes that consistently and predictably deliver these positive results. And so it's what it really is, is a business growth formula. It's an engine that helps you grow your business. It's an engine that helps you build a better culture and really build a better team. And it's an engine that delivers more freedom and both financially and time and resource wise in your own personal lives. And this is the exact formula that I've used to grow my business, to, to sell to lots of other, other people over the years. And the, the power is in the, the, the steps, both front stage and backstage, we really need systems and processes. And a lot of entrepreneurs, like we, we resist having those systems and processes. We don't love those so much. 
But at the same time, we kind of like having them in our business. We just don't want ourselves operating them. So what this allows you to do is kind of put in systems and processes that you can have as a framework and a structure for your entire business and for your entire team to work on. And then it gives you opportunities to really kind of zone out. You zoom out and you are able to kind of work on your business, not just in your business. And you can actually start to look at how to manage this because that's where like it gets even more fun and gets more exciting. And we layer in bits of gamification into this. How do we get our customers more engaged? How do we do awards, rewards, uh, acknowledgements, rituals? How do we um, how do we make the culture of our entire organization, not just our inside our organization with our team, but outside of our organization? How do we build such strong relationships and bonds with our clients that what we call the lifetime value of the customer goes through the roof? They're they're so allegiant that they'll actually be more forgiving. Like if someone were to complain online about you in a review, you'll see that a a whole mass of your customers, your raving fans will come and they will defend you furiously against that customer. And then all of a sudden that review is irrelevant anymore because it was a person that was having a bad day or it was an extenuating circumstance. But then you're actually not having to police and worry about all those things. It's these people are able to, to kind of come in at your rescue and help because they care. They're connected to your brand and they're connected to your success because you've impacted them. So it's such an important, uh, in, in, you know, in my opinion, from where I say it, it's such an important um, skill set to learn. It's such an important thing to kind of integrate into your business. I don't think of customer experience as a layer on top. I think of it as something that's truly like woven into the fabric of your business. And, uh, and it really helps people enjoy the process more. Uh, and uh, everyone that I've worked with has made significantly more money. One of, the, one of the cool things that happens is you actually get rid of some of the stuff you're doing in your business. Now, you get a stop doing list out of this, too, ironically. <laughs> we were saying that earlier. But what you'll find is a lot of things that you do in your business, you're doing because you always have or you thought you should. But it wasn't by design again. And so we've often, you know, people say, oh, I don't have any budget to do anything for my customer experience. Great. I don't think you necessarily need to. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But one of the critical things that you look at is, is what we're doing now sufficient to create that delight? Is it sufficient to create raving fans? Or are we doing things that we think are great that are actually uh, maybe frustrating clients and we didn't even realize it? And there's a lot of that. So it's, it's important to kind of take time, uh, step back and really look at those things. And um, it'll change everything. Well, you know, every business that's listening to this, every business that exists has a customer experience. Yes, whether you think it's a good one or a bad one or you thought about it or not, yeah. it's happening. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, really, really what you're saying is, you know, this is probably one of the, the most important points of leverage you have to grow the business, to create, to have the business be created um, in a way that's conscious rather than unconscious. Um, and yes. I'm, I'm a big believer whether it's in, in, you know, our focus is working with our clients on, you know, helping them put a message out that's going to attract new clients to them. And, and we go through the same challenge. A lot of times people have a message that they have kind of fallen into and become unconscious about. And by make, by making that more conscious, they almost immediately get better results. And my sense is that even if you don't change very much, just simply by becoming more conscious of the experience, it's going to improve. Yeah. And you know, you start putting language to things, you know, it's, you know, the, the world changed when we were able to have, you know, more, more written word and more printed word and more, more definitions and more language out there. Cultures are built on language, you know, communities are built on language. And so when you can start to identify parts of your process and parts of the journey for the customers and speak to what you want them to feel, all of a sudden, like the way that your entire organization talks about it, the language that your customers use about you and about their experience is your language. And it starts to give meaning to certain things. Like I threw out the name ideal customer script, right? That's what we call that thing. Now we can talk about it. Otherwise, it's just like, oh, yeah, the kind of stuff that they say. So we start to name things. We package them in certain ways. And you should all be thinking about this when it comes to your brand. The key thing that you said also, or that got me to think is, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to attract new customers. And a lot of our focus when when things get tough in our businesses or, you know, we, we realize we need to make a little more money or we want to hire some more staff, but we can't support it all. So we need more revenue. Like more revenue is always a, a thing, right? It should be. We need more revenue, we need cash flow, we need profits, right? The thing is, when you start focusing on new revenue, we go to new business, new clients, new relationships, which is important. We need to have that. But we also need to look at our existing clients and how do we create more value for them? 
one of the amazing things that comes out of this whole process is you start to identify new products and services and new needs and wants that your existing clients have, and you can start to fulfill them and support them. And the revenue, there's no cost to client acquisition. All the lunches, the dinners, the, the, uh, the digital marketing, the, the brochures, all the stuff that you do for new business, if they're existing clients and you can then bring them into more products and services that, are, that they truly need and want, there's no cost of customer acquisition. Your profits are going to go up for most of that stuff usually. And the respect and the gratitude from those customers is going to go up too because you're listening to their needs. You're, you're giving them what they want. You're giving them what they need. And it's important. What I see most often times with businesses is that we, you know, it's, it's like, it's like dating, right? I use the analogy of dating all the time. You know, you meet a new uh, attractive female or male and you go through this whole courtship phase and you do everything that you can. You think about exactly what you're going to wear. When should I call them? Where should we go? How soon after the date should I call them back? You're really specific. And this is kind of how I want you to think about your experience, like all those touch points. But after like the fifth or sixth date, things are going well. You know, you're not as intentional about all the little details. And then, you know, you, you're you know, engaged and then you get married and you have the honeymoon phase. And then all of a sudden it becomes kind of second you know, second thought, like you're not really intentionally thinking about all those different kinds of things. You're not as detailed about it. And and then it takes like some bad stuff to happen before you say, oh, wait, maybe we should have a date night every week again. Now you all of a sudden you start going back to caring for the existing customer, if you will. And it's a mistake to do that in your personal life, but it's also a mistake to do it in your business life. Those most important clients and relations to the people that have stepped up to the plate and decided to choose you and work with you you need to give them some love and you need to care for them and you need to do things to nurture those relationships. I remember I had this uh, bad story, uh, but quick story. You know, I was, I was looking at my business and we were trying to think of how do we grow? How do we grow? Where do we, where do we get our relationships from? We were trying to reverse engineer how to get more growth. And when I went back and I started looking at the center of influence, whoever referred different customers to me, it, 80% of my customers went back to one person who I absolutely ignored. And we're talking about millions of dollars of contracts. This wasn't like little, little, you know, stuff. And, and this was someone that I took for granted because we were friends. Like I was like, you know what? I don't need to spend time with him because he's sending me business anyway. And when I started to spend more time, not because I was like trying to be false, but like I really was grateful. I liked him anyway, but I just didn't, I didn't focus on it. I, again, like you might take a, a personal relationship for granted. I was taking him for granted. And when I changed that, the floodgates open like that. We had massive growth. We were having like 400% year over year growth. And it was because we started to learn how to do that, how to care for those relationships. And that wasn't even a customer. That was a referral partner. And so I, I, you know, I, I just encourage you to really think about the existing relationships that you have, the partners. When I say customer, I actually use the term audience because it's not just customers, it's customers, clients, it's prospects, it's partners, it's vendors, it's JVs, it's affiliates, it's other people that are on the outside that really they each have their own journey with you and they each have their own experience. And if you want these people to help you build your business, to support you, um, it really behooves you to look at the experience that they're all having, even if they're just vendors that you use or contractors that you recommend or, or you know, whatever, what other partnerships you have. It's really important. It's not just the people that are writing you a check. And when you start to be that intentional, they start to love you more. They start to reform our business. They start to support you in other ways. And it's just a, such a positive cycle. And that's really part of my big why. I mean, I, my big why is helping entrepreneurs grow and succeed. My plan is to, I want to help, you know, millions of entrepreneurs. And, and for me, I think that that's like a hard thing to do. So again, in this kind of Dan Sullivan way, the way I look at it is by like the ripple effect. So I'm, my focus now is to take 10,000 entrepreneurs work closely with them and help them transform their businesses because I know the ripple effects of that is going to help so many other ones. And so for the next five years, my mission is to, you know, touch in some meaningful way, you know, 10,000 entrepreneurs, get them through this process, get them to understand this framework because it just flat out works. Every single customer that I've ever, that's ever done it with me has, has grown tremendously, both on the inside with employees, you know, more employee loyalty, not having as many, you know, mishires or, or terminations or, or people resigning, what have you. And it just builds a much happier place. And that ties into the biggest why, which is I, I can't stand going and having a bad experience. I had a bad experience with my, my car dealership, you know, with a service problem that I was having. And I went to drop my car off. We had 
spent hours and hours working through all the details with my assistant, like, because we had to coordinate having a loaner car and having this and having that. I got there. They had no record of me. They were rude. They finally, like, pulled out, like, a dirty car from the back to just give me to get back to where I was going. And I've spent, between myself and referrals that I've made to this dealership, over a half a million dollars in business has come directly from me. It's like, why would they treat me so poorly? But what it did was that there was a ripple effect from that experience. It, it tarnished my day. And then I was frustrated. And then, I, you know, and so I just think the more that there's just such a positive cycle of momentum when we start to create these good experiences for our customers, for our employees, for our teams, and it translates back into our home, to our families. And so it's just such an important thing to do in today's world, I believe. And so that's that's why I'm so committed to it. Well, Jason, thanks for sharing everything that you have. I know we went a little bit long today, but I think it was it was well worth investing the time. Um, this has been hugely valuable. And I know everybody that listens is going to get a ton out of it. I have um, kind of two final questions. The, the first is one that I, I like asking um, selfishly because I learn a tremendous amount and I always uh, am able to add to my reading list when I do so. But I'd love to know, what are you reading right now? What's on top of your reading list? Uh, on the top of my reading list right now is uh, the new edition of Predictably Irrational. Uh, I, I don't know if you've read the first version. The first version was awesome. There's a new version out. So I've just started reading it again. And it's uh, just a phenomenal book that helps you focus on the behavioral economics of how people make pricing, uh, buying decisions based on pricing and stuff. It's a definite amazing read. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, one of my other kind of favorite books uh, of all time, um, Beyond Think and Grow Rich, which I love, 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 uh, Masterminds and what have you, is uh, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. Um, which I think is another amazing uh, book. Um, so yeah, yeah, those are those are three big recommendations. Yeah, great, great books. Thanks so much for sharing those. And uh, where can folks find out more about what you're doing and, and get in touch with you? Sure. So I set up a, a special page for you because again, customer experience. You want to um, want to make sure that we do something special for your your people. So if you go to go g o dot c x formula dot com forward slash unstoppable. Uh, we have a, a free download for you there. It's the three hacks to wow your customers. So it gives you three strategies that you can put in place in less than 10 minutes um, that were are transformational. And um, one of them uh, is something that I do. You'll read it in the, in the little PDF that I have for you. But one of them is something I do in my personal life. And it has made all the difference in the world. So definitely go check it out. It, like I said, it'll take you 10 minutes to, to read it and you'll be able to implement some of those really soon. And, uh, you know, if you have questions or whatever, I'd love to hear about your, you know, your, your rea reaction to it, how it worked for you or not. Um, I'm, I'm available always at Jason at CXFormula.com for any questions or uh, any, uh, any feedback. Would love it. Awesome. Thanks so much for uh, sharing everything that you have today. It's been really, really valuable. And uh, can't wait till we connect again. I, I, we could probably sit here for hours and have, have this conversation. But, uh, Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jason. Take care. All right, Steve. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating on iTunes at unstoppableceo.net forward slash iTunes.